Welcome to this session of Moisha House's Learning Lab, uh, near, far, wherever you are. Uh, this is our, like I just said, weekly educational series on all things virtual, getting comfortable on camera, learning new things about this, this new tech age that we're living in. Uh, and today we are joined by the wonderful Taylor Louderman for a whole uh, session on making Zoom your stage and camera presence, which I can't think of a thing that is more needed at this moment and that people are thinking about as they're inundated on Zoom calls every single day. So thank you so much for joining us, Taylor. Uh, just a couple pieces from me. Oh, and also, hi, my name is Kristen. I am the Moisha House Marketing uh, and Communications Associate. Uh, I'm based here in San Diego and just super excited to be here and be talking more about uh, virtual learning with you all. Uh, I just want to quickly go over our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to have a quick introduction and then we're going to throw it right over to Taylor, who's going to give us some tips on camera presence. Uh, and then we're going to move into a Q&A portion of this session. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat, uh, and we will be responding to as many questions as we can. And then we're going to move okay. into some breakout groups, and we'll share some final thoughts. So it's a pretty standard agenda for today's call. And obviously, if you're encountering any issues throughout the call, please be free, feel free to leave them in the chat and we will have somebody uh, assist you with whatever's going on. Uh, but I definitely am very excited to get started and introduce the star of the show today, uh, Taylor Louderman. You might know Taylor uh, as the original Regina George from Mean Girls on Broadway. Uh, she also has uh, been in Kinky Boots. She's been in Bring It On. Uh, she has uh, created Write Out Loud, which is a songwriting competition, uh, and also is the uh, is planning on making her directorial debut at Ozark, Ozark Actors Theater, uh, and where she's also an executive con executive consultant. Uh, so we're really, really excited to have her here, and I'm tripping over my words because I'm so excited. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Taylor, uh, and I just want to throw it over to you. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen and Eliza, um, for, for helping me create this whole uh, slideshow, this whole presentation. And to my friends, Roe and Abby, for connecting me with all of you today. This is so incredible. And I want to say how grateful I am that during these challenging times and, and the social distancing that we have technology to stay connected and to communicate. Um, I'm just, I'm just really grateful to, to be here and be able to do that with all of you. Um, so, you know, when, when, when Rowie and Abby first approached me about doing something like this, I was like, gosh, I don't know as much about, uh, Zoom presenting as I do about being on stage, but gosh, they are a lot alike. And I think, um, I, and I have been teaching a lot via Zoom lately and, and made a lot of discoveries through that, but, uh, <laughs> The, the, the first thing that comes to mind that is an obstacle for, I think, everyone, and, and I want to sort of hear from you guys, is just the, the, the nerves that pop up and the anxiety we have around uh, the fear of, of public speaking. So uh, how many of you are uh, afraid of, of that? I can't really see your hands, but I'm going to hope that a lot of you have your hands up because... Um, you know, the, the, the National Institute of Mental Health at least says that 73% of the population shares this fear of, of public speaking. And, and sometimes it's, a, it's greater than the fear of, of death itself. Um, and I, in my career uh, on Broadway, I went through a wild phase of being deathly afraid of going on stage. And it was my job. Um, and, I, and so I did a lot the, the, the lawnmower is going outside, so I'm gonna take a second to shut my door so you don't all hear that. Hold on. <laughs> I had my door open because the weather's so nice, but I did not just read that. So anyway, um, you know, why do we have this, this fear of, of public speaking and, I, I think it's it's any time that we perceive a threat in life, and it's a beautiful mechanism that we have because it, it's in an effort to protect ourselves, right? But anytime we have this this threat of of 
I think our social status or our credibility or our communication skills, we go into this, this fight or flight mode, or I like to also include freeze, right? Have you guys uh, ever experienced that where you just stand there and freeze? A lot of my students do that, or, or I'll do it on stage when I forget a, a line or something. Um, and so why, why does that happen? And, uh, and I think it goes back to that evolutionary psychology where we really wanted to maintain our social status within our pack because that's where we have our resources. But I don't think that the reactions that we have today are as warranted. It's not life or death, right? So just having that level of awareness um, and understanding sort of how your nerves manifest themselves. For everybody, it's a little bit of that. But um, just to take a look at this diagram here, this flipping the lens, is a great analogy that I use with my students um, and for myself. But what happens when we when we do go into fight or flight mode is no longer are we able to reason. So you have the amygdala, which is sort of those those primitive instincts. It's the alarm center. It's your your crazy emotions that's here, and then the prefrontal cortex is your reasoning, um, sort of your level headedness, your normal calm self. And when they can communicate with each other, all is well. But when you flip a lid, when anxiety happens, that alarm goes off and you flip your lid and no longer are they able to communicate. No longer are you able to receive information, um, communicate clearly, reason, have empathy, et cetera. So trying to maintain calm and clear minded is, is huge uh, when we go into these presentational modes or, or get on stage and whatnot. Um, so uh, how do we conquer this fear? Well, I ask myself three questions when I approach uh, a song or when I have my students approach the song because it helps us stay focused on the task at hand. Um, and those three questions are, what do you want? Who are you talking to? And what is the moment before? So um, what do you want is definitely just taking into account your objective. What's your goal, right? What are you there to communicate? What do you want? Um, and I think one thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes we put the pressure on ourselves that we are there to prove that we're a good presenter, or we're good at talking, or we're good at singing, dancing, whatever. But really why we're there is, is to communicate a story or a point or teach a lesson, right? To offer our perspective. And so um, taking the pressure off of yourself and just always realigning with what you want um is huge chris we can go ahead and go to that next slide of what you want yeah perfect um and then of course with your content whatever you have to say you want to be creative and make it engaging right so um in musical theater we will call that our tactic so uh with what i want i'm going to change my tactic in order to get it from my scene partner and um for you in your zoom sessions that might be just adding a little bit of variety of facts, figures, stories, uh, telling a joke. I, I use the flip book analogy. So if you have a flip book, you know, and the ball stays in the same place the whole time, you all know what a flip book is, I hope. Um, it, it's way less interesting, right? You want to add a little bit of variety in there and um, you want to be your, your authentic self. And again, that goes back to the flipping the lid, right? We can't achieve that um, creativity and spontaneity without being in that, that calm place. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is you want to be efficient with your time. I mean, how many of you right now feel like there are 500 things per day competing for your attention? Um, it, it's insane right now. So really just be cognizant of the fact that there are so many distractions out there. You want to get to your point. Um, uh, I, I love it whenever there are audience members, especially the elder men in the front row falling asleep. Um, it's a good gauge for me that I need to probably go louder, faster, funnier. At least that's what we say in musical theater. Yeah. Louder, faster, funnier. Get to your point a little bit quicker. Add some enthusiasm. Um, and, and for comedy, you know, the element of surprise is always useful. Um, you never want your audience to get ahead of you. You never want them to know what's coming next. So uh, read your room, right? Uh, if there's if there's yawning, if the eyes are darting off, if there's people on their phones, it's probably a good indicator that you could um, speed up or or add some enthusiasm in there, etc. Let's go to our our next point. Uh, who am I talking to? So in in uh, theater, I always try to choose a scene partner, or especially in an audition mode, you don't have a scene partner. You're like talking to a void, which is what it feels like on Zoom sometimes. Um, I always try to choose uh, someone I'm talking to who really needs to hear what I'm saying. 
um, cause usually that'll encourage me to, to get in a, a sense of flow where, um, my, my main goal is again, getting my point across. So, uh, I like to say, use empathy, right? Cater, cater to, to your audience, know your audience, step into their shoes. Why are they showing up? Well, they're probably showing up because they want to hear what you have to say. They're probably not showing up to, to judge your communication skills. Um, they're usually focusing on themselves and then, um, prep, uh, cater to your, to your audience by, uh, practicing, right? Like use, uh, friends, uh, uh to, to try your, your presentation on. I think we, we feel more comfortable when we know and we can anticipate how our audience is going to react, right? Um, when I was in Kibbutz, I, I had to replace in that show, so I didn't get the luxury of um, rehearsal mode and collaborating with my all my cast. When you're replacing in a, in a show, you just jump in. You're rehearsing with your, your stage manager or your assistant director. So I remember, I remember being... Uh, scared hoopless that I was gonna go out there and nobody was gonna think it was funny and I'd be making a complete fool of myself and I'm talking about like it was a song where my character was uh, had that light bulb moment of just just realizing she likes a guy and she has to be really quirky and and um I, I was just terrified that what I had drummed up or just bring my most authentic self to the table was not going to to be enough um but slowly uh, but surely uh, started trusting it and then opening night for me at least um, they laughed they laughed and then suddenly I get this this the science of comedy I call it where okay the, this night I'm gonna have the, that light bulb moment oh I like him is right okay they laugh uh, now I'm gonna amp it up like by 10% uh, the next night to see if it's it's even funnier <sighs> Right. And if it is, I'm going to keep going. If it's not, I'm going to, uh, to stop, but sort of just gauging, um, gauging your audience and knowing, uh, knowing them, I think can help us and give us the confidence to, to keep going and be our, be ourselves. Right. Um, that element of surprise. Uh, the last thing is read the room. So I've, I've had the luxury of working on a stage where you are talking to 11,000 people, uh, and then also working on, um, you know, NBC live does those, um, they'll do a theater show, uh, but live. So I did Peter Pan live. So I was used to being on stage, but then had to adapt to a screen that's right here. So no longer am I relying on my full body to communicate, but mostly my face. And that's what we're doing here on zoom. Um, not to mention you're usually seeing into people's living rooms. And, uh, I love that because you learn so much about them. Uh, but that, that calls for a greater uh, intimacy, right? We're not in a stuffy, um, a stuffy conference room. So you want to adapt to that, to that energy. And, and I like to use the analogy of in, in musical theater, we have all these elements that are helping us tell the story. And we want to um, lean on those elements, like the music, right? If the music gets louder and bigger, then I know to match that with my energy. And so if you want to lean on your emotional and social social intelligence and, and trust your instincts right we're storytellers all day long we're communicating all day long you know um so trust those instincts uh, in terms of, of your communication um and then if if mistakes happen again rely on on your on your audience um a little bit and trust them a little bit they're gonna rally with you uh i like to use improvisation when I mess up, which is, uh, I can only achieve when my lid is not flipped, but, uh, or laughing it off. And in Mean Girls, we, uh, we had a moment where a character, not me, luckily, has a ripaway costume, which means that they're changing it on stage super fast. And one night, uh, there's somebody who gets behind my friend Erica. She played Katie in Mean Girls, for those of you who know the show. Uh, she wore a dress over top of a sort of casual outfit and they rip away. So uh, the guy playing Damien comes up behind her and grabs the dress and it splits apart in front. Well, one day uh, it also somehow hooked onto her shirt and her wig. So off came her whole costume and she was left in her bra and a mic belt, just like the little belt that holds the microphone. And then her pin curls, which is what we wear underneath our wigs. And uh, I don't think she even knew that it happened because she was so used to that feeling uh, and there's no mirror on stage. Um, but the audience was like, oh my gosh. 
And um, there was nothing we, really, we could really do because she doesn't come off stage for like another 20 minutes. So they bring down the curtain and the stage manager comes over the intercom saying, so sorry, we're gonna take a moment and hold. Everyone rallies backstage to, to get it back together. But when the curtain did come back up, that audience was just so alive and excited. And they just they just loved it. I think sometimes when we can show those imperfections, uh, it helps our audience root for us a little bit more and, and latch on. So um, don't be don't be terrified of, of those freeze moments. Uh, we're all human and we're we're likely gonna be there for each other and, and uh, be understanding. Uh, and then we have the moment before. Yeah. Uh, so vocal warm ups are going to be helpful, I think, in, in this setting. Um, that's a UCLA came, professor came up with that 73855 rule of, of personal communication. And uh, I think that's true, especially in these Zoom settings. You're relying on your voice to do so much of the communication, you don't have your full body. And, uh, sometimes you don't even see uh, your face. So um, just being aware of that and understanding that the enthusiasm in your voice can do a lot. Uh, and so I have these, these warm ups that I like to do. Uh, your vocal cords are like muscles. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna just challenge you all. I don't think I can see you, but I hope you'll join me in this. Um, a vocal exercise that I like to do is called a lip trill, and uh, I'm gonna do one, and then I hope you will join me in it so I don't feel like a complete idiot, although I think you all are on mute, so I won't hear you all. Taylor, so, Taylor I'm gonna stop screen, screen sharing so that we can all see each other. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, amazing. So a lip trill, I'll demonstrate. <laughs> okay, you ready to do it with me? Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, so that's useful, especially if you're doing, yeah, High School Musical. I see that in the chat, exactly. Ma, 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 right? That's what they did. Uh, especially in the morning, if you've got a Zoom call in the morning, um, everything's still asleep, including all the muscles around here. And if you're tense and you're nervous, uh, this is gonna be a problem. So those lip throws are really useful. Here's another one for you. Will you, will you go back to that so I can see everybody? Thanks. It's a siren. So because those vocal cords, uh, they're like a muscle, we gotta stretch them out. I see some of you with a reaction to the siren. You must know what I mean by that. So I'll demonstrate and let's do it. Ooh. I'm sure everyone in my house is annoyed, uh, but let's do it together, ready? And so on a good day, uh, if I'm being my good singer self, I don't want to have a break between my chest voice and my head voice. Anyway, um, those are great exercises for you uh, just to warm up your voice. Let's go back to our, uh, yes, one minute testing, thank you. Um, great ways to, to warm up that voice because again, that is doing so much of the communication for you over these Zoom calls. Um, the other, the other thing that I, a uh, useful tool that I, that I have for you is a power pose. Um, I forgot who initially came up with the, the, the power pose, but I've adopted it. Uh, basically it's an, it's any expansive posture, uh, makes me feel more powerful. And, uh, the theory is that if you do it for two minutes, it, the body and mind, I think are so much more connected than, than, um, Western mentality believes. And, uh, all of my career, I just feel like lining up everything mentally and physically is, is huge. So power pose, I'll stand up here, uh, would be something like this, right? Or um, if you can see me, this, anything that makes you feel powerful. Um, I always go back to that evolutionary biology thing. Like if there's a bear across the way, they tell us to get big and, uh, and yell loud and um, I think our natural inclination is to shrink up and get small. And so uh, all of these sort of physicalities, I think, communicate with your mind and help you understand that there's not a huge threat in front of you. You're okay. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> in terms of sort of mindfulness, uh, I'm sure you all have heard these things flowing down your breath right? Taking a beat. I also like zooming out, just understanding, again, checking in with why you're showing up, what you really want to accomplish. Um, I like to say that, you know, be careful what you worry about because it just might come true. So when I was in my uh, phase of 
terrifying stage fright, I would go out on stage and I'd start the show. And on the outside, I became very good at looking like I was fine. But on the inside, my, my heart is beating and my mind is racing to the point where I start challenging myself of whether I know what's coming up or not. So I'd like to say the line in my head before I say it out loud. Well, so often when I was in that sort of brain space, uh, I sort of manifested the, the, the white room, what we call it. Uh, so I have this fond memory. Uh, no, it's not fond. It's fond for others, not me. But uh, I'm on stage in the musical Bring It On, which is a lot like the, the movie, um, the cheerleading mu movie. And it's a song. It's like a patter song. It was written by Lin-Manuel Lin -Manuel Miranda. How many of you have heard of Hamilton? Yeah, that guy. And he writes these amazing songs, but they're like quick and they're fast and they're, they rhyme and they're, they're incredible. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately for going to the white room, very challenging. So um, I, am, I am talking about how angry I was that this girl offended me. And I, I just went up. I went up on, on the lines, couldn't think of, of what those lyrics were and just start babbling off, uh, luckily still in line with the story. And somehow they did rhyme. Uh, and my scene partners on stage were supposed to have a straight face. We're just <laughs> dying laughing. And we could hear everyone in the background uh, in, of the theater behind the curtain being like, oh my God. You know, meanwhile, I'm like in tears because I, I don't know why that happened. I don't know why that happened. Uh, well, I can tell you now, looking back, I, I made it happen because I was, I was allowing my brain to focus on uh, things going wrong. So I just, I just really encourage you, and this goes to the, that self-talk there. Um, and I, I started a, a t-shirt line with a positive inner monologue across the top because I really learned in playing Regina George that I had to show up with confidence and I had to start taking control over my mind and, and, and understanding that um, I can focus on positivity. I can po focus on the excitement instead of the anxiety. And um, it just, it just in a huge way affects the, the outcome. Um, uh, and, and just trusting, you know, my, my instincts and trusting that I am enough. I think so often as a performer, I start associating my self-worth with the product and that's when I run into a lot of issues. And so I encourage you all, um, along with all of these things to just focus on your, your everyday, your day-to-day self-talk. When I was stressed during my day, it would come into my, my performance, uh, in a big way. Um, so, so that's sort of it for my, my tips and tricks. And now I would love to hear from you all um, your questions. Thank you so much, Taylor. I'm sure a lot of that, we had a lot of nodding heads throughout that entire presentation. Uh, I'm sure, so I'm sure a ton of that resonated. So right now, everyone, if you can please leave any um, questions that you have in the comments section, and we're going to uh, start responding to some of those. Uh, the first one that I'm seeing comes from Rowie, which is when you're noticing something going wrong, uh, is it Regina noticing that something's happening and how would Regina respond? Or is Taylor as Regina knowing something is happening? So this is a little bit more of an actory uh, question, but I do think it's uh, something that we can all, we're all sort of putting on a little bit of a persona when we get on camera, I think. So I think that this still uh, comes into play. Yeah, well, it's a great question. I think that I, I, in order to achieve authenticity, I have to bring an element of myself to every character. But I use, um, I use my, my experiences to create that that character, right? So any mean girl that I had in high school, I'm so grateful for them because I'm I'm using that. You know, if there was ever a point in my life where I was mean and uh, <laughs> was the Regina George, I'm accessing that too. So it's a little bit of both, really. Um It's a little bit of both, and I think it. Uh, definitely, I rely on my emotional and social intelligence and my instincts to, to know how Regina would respond in that moment. Uh, but I also have to get out of my own way and, and trust that, which is an obstacle in and of itself. <laughs> um, Ziva is asking if you can uh, please clarify what the white room is that you referred to. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's just a phrase we call when we, when we go up on a line. You like go to the white room in your head. You, you, you guys have been there, or like when you're trying to figure out the word you're looking for, it's like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, it's, it's that. 
Uh, ben asks, on Zoom when public speaking, do you focus looking on the camera as opposed to looking at yourself? And I'm going to add on to this a question that I feel like we've been hearing a lot from people. Yeah, what do you do with your hands? What do you do you <laughs> directly into the camera? Uh, I think there's a, something to like body awareness that people are now like fi fidgeting a lot on screen because they just don't quite know what to do. So anything that you can um, speak to on that, I think would be really helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, I would encourage you to trust your instincts and not overthink it too much. I mean, you want to you wanna seem really comfortable. Anytime I notice a performer is nervous, I suddenly take that on too, and I get nervous with them as well. In musical theater, uh, we don't want people to look directly at um, like the auditors, I guess. If you're looking, at, if it's a scene partner, yeah. I don't tend to look at the camera, although I'm doing it right now, but I don't think it matters so, so much. Um, I mean, what do you do when you're FaceTiming your friends? Um, you're likely not looking at the camera, you're looking at them. So I'm checking in with my audience a lot, making sure they don't look bored. Um, I am, I admit, looking at myself to make sure my hair is not like sticking up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and in terms of like, you know, uh, using your body, I, I, I often challenge my students, to, you want to achieve that sense of flow where you're focused so much on communicating. In real life, when I'm having uh, an argument with somebody, I am not thinking about okay, do, do this with my hand in order to get the point across, right? It's all flowing out of me naturally in an effort to get what I want from them. Um, and so I really encourage you to just um, think about what you would do in, re in a real life situation when you're communicating. I think folks. going right off of that, just for one more beat on that, um, on that question, Joshua asks like thoughts on sitting or standing while presenting. And I'm curious if that, like, if there's anything to power posing when it comes to that, like, if, is there something to maybe standing versus sitting, uh, if you have a preference or recommendation? Yeah, I guess I would say, uh, you want to, uh, what, what, what are you presenting, right? If it's a more formal setting and it makes sense to, to be standing, um, like for, for this right today, I was like, eh, this makes sense to be sitting. You're all sitting, you're at home in your living rooms. This is casual, this is chill, right? So match that energy of what, what who you're talking to and, and what you have to say. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's weird when you see someone in a big business suit and they're sitting in their living room and you can like see everything behind them. It's just like those, the, in our society, those things don't match up, right? So um, trust those instincts, right? What would you do if you had everyone over in your living room? Um. <laughs> totally. It sounds like yeah. all of this is really lines up with that matching the energy sort of uh, mentality of like matching what that energy is and what your energy is and what makes you yeah and it's like in musical theater you have all these elements that are working together to tell the story right the lighting the set the costumes um the music is always a guidepost for me when i'm trying to figure out how to choreograph uh how i tell the story right if if the if the notes get higher and higher i likely know that the intensity of the emotions are getting higher and higher right so it's just being able to gauge and read um, all of those elements match that. Yeah. We are now getting some mean girls questions, which is unsurprising. Uh, <laughs> we have from Emma, uh, did you get to work with anyone from the original movie cast when you were working on mean girls? And if so, what was your, uh, experience with them? Uh, I know that you, I'm pretty sure you've spoken before too, that you work, you did work with Tina Fey at the very least, I know. Yeah, so, so if you can speak to any of that. Yeah, no, we didn't have um, the cast come uh, to, to rehearsals or anything, which I'm actually grateful for because that would have been very intimidating for me. Um, but <laughs> Tina Fey wrote the movie and also the script to the musical and her husband wrote the music. Um, so they were both super duper involved. They were also producers along with Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live. So they were very, very involved there every day. We we're making changes all the time. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are interested in Tina Fey, so I'll say this, um, shy, really, really shy. Uh, and what I thought I was gonna be walking into was, or at least I gave Tina Fey permission before even walking into the room, to dictate exactly what I did, right? If she had an idea, I was like, yes, it's you, whatever you want, whatever you want, you you, you know everything. Um, but she was very much egoless, and, uh, and I think that's a testament to her improv experience, where improv, you, you have to throw your ego out the door. Like, you have to say yes and and show up and just like ride your instincts. You don't have time to ruminate on whether an idea is good or bad. And so I think that, uh, 
that helped her uh, and, and then us just go with the best idea always wins. It doesn't matter whose it is. It didn't have to be Tina's. The best idea always wins. And that's that mentality of like creativity and ideas exist in, in the universe, whatever. And they just pop into our heads uh, and we either receive them. And if we don't take them, somebody else will, right? It's like, we don't have ownership over these things. Um, that's what I had to say about Tina Fey. She's incredible. That's amazing. It's obviously always really lovely to hear those wonderful things about people that you admire, as I'm sure many people admire uh, Tina Fey. Uh, I have a question from Jeremy who asks, uh, when you're doing power poses, do you think about anything in particular or do you empty your mind? Is it, what's oh. your experience for that? Yeah, I do think you want to, uh sort of like align the mechanism, if you will. Um, so whether that means you need to empty out the negative thoughts or just have more of those positive thoughts, right? You wanna mirror that, that power pose with a calm sense and also a confidence, right? So I think it's a, a little bit of, of both, but the idea is just to get you um, in that, that place in here. <laughs> Our next question is from Celine. She's asking, do you have any tips for recording vocals or feeling like you can't get a good take? And I think that this really does um, uh, come into play with, I think there are a lot of people right now also prepping for like recorded Zoom calls and those sorts of things. And so I think that this uh, transcend, transcends into a couple different things. Do you have any tips for, she's finding herself uh, like recording this, uh, singing it a million times around the house, uh, but when she goes to the microphone, microphone to record it, it doesn't sound as good. Oh, yeah. Well, when I watch back something or listen to something, I'm really hard on myself. I think we all are. Um, and we're our big, we're our most, like our biggest critics. Um, so just have a little compassion for yourself, first of all, I would say, and, and know that perfectionism is likely not going to serve this. Um, and, um, I, I will also say that I do my recordings a million times too, because I'm not satisfied with, <laughs> uh, the end goal. So, um, I, I think though, you know, go back to, are you getting your point across and, and all that? And don't, don't get too, uh, stuck on the product. I, I think I'm going to the end game. Amazing. I'm going to try and get through a couple more questions here. Um, how do, uh, this is from Eliana. I hope I'm saying her name right. Uh, how do we find the line between feeling like our Zoom call is us performing in front of our community versus creating an interactive space uh, to more similar of how like an event would be? Uh, so a little bit on creating um, uh, on performance in front of a camera, I think. Yeah, it is a balance. You're right. Uh, you want to definitely understand that you have the stage right when it's your turn to talk uh but you don't want it to feel i don't think super duper formal i would i would um uh, encourage you to add ways to get your audience engaged right there are some really cool zoom features where you can raise your hand um right yeah you can take polls um uh, and so i i always like the the question and answer thing that's always great and you know, the attention spans of people, especially on screens right now, I think is really like five minutes or less. So um, I would think about that. And, you know, and, and two, I always encourage my, my students when they're performing just to add uh, gratitude and, and positivity and, and enthusiasm whenever they can because people root for that people latch on to that and it, when i've got a main character in a musical that's that's one of the the first things you're gonna in order to get their audience the audience to latch on to them um they're they're gonna be these qualities that make them likable right and um often when we're approaching a song i say if you can add a smile in there anything to brighten you up lighten you up i say run with that um, people just cheer are cheerleaders for that totally um the, our next question, sorry, the chat box is moving so quickly that I lost my next question. Um, our next question is from Alana, uh, who asks, uh, if you find your voice faltering or shaking like due to nerves when public speaking, what do you recommend to fix it? I think that that's definitely something a lot of people are encountering right now. And I wonder if that the answer to that is enthusiasm and trying to push through that. Yeah, that's likely um, a, an indication of breath right? We get that shortness of breath when we're anxious. So um, it all goes back to trying to achieve this sort of state. And again, I, it's easier said than done, I know, because 
I was nervous for this call and yet I'm telling you all how to not be nervous, right? But you're going to have those nerves. They just show, they're just there. And so it's a matter of learning how to manage them. And again, everyone's different. So you want to get to know yourself. Um, but I, I always go back to uh, zooming out and really understanding why are you here? You are not here to be judged on um, whether you're the world's best presenter or world's best actor, right? Art in, in, in any anything like this is relative. What some person loves, another person might hate. So just checking back in with your why, with your goal, with your objective, um, and, 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 and remembering uh, what you're trying to communicate. I know Amazing. it's easier said than done. <laughs> I think we're I think we're closing up on the time for uh, questions. We're getting near there, but I'm going to do one final one from David, who asks, "What is your suggestion for like amount of time for Zoom events so people don't get fatigued, or um, for a presentation so that people aren't feeling that Zoom fatigue?" <sighs> you know, that's a great question. I work mostly with. Um teenagers and for them it's like 45 minutes and I give them like a five minute break. Um, if they're up on their feet a little bit sometimes we'll in the middle of it do something where I ask them to get on on their feet whether it's just this exercise which calms us down arms up and exhale. Um, that's always helpful for them. Uh, just taking a little breather uh, and, and directing their focus elsewhere, even if it is a two minute bathroom break, whatever. Um, but just, just remember that our attention spans are small and when we aren't able to connect with people or looking at these screens, I think it's even and smaller um, but I do think it's gonna it's gonna depend on what you're talking about how much can you engage your audience um, and 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 look at them look around the room and, and see um, that they'll tell that they will tell you a lot just like your audience does on on stage oh well thank you so much for doing this Q&A session with us I think this was so helpful uh, we're gonna move now into our breakout groups and before we move into our breakout group I think transitioning sort of into this I sort of have a final question for you in our next section uh, we're gonna be splitting everyone up and we're gonna be having people workshop your storytelling skills so we're gonna have everyone grab an item in your nearby space and tell a short story about it. It can be a funny story, it can be a serious story. And then as a group, we're asking these groups to discuss what you learned about each other's camera presence. And do you have any suggestions on giving feedback to people on their camera presence? And uh, the, I think something um, that we've talked before this call is how important positive feedback is just as, as much as uh, critical feedback and giving that sort of thing. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I have two things to say on this. Um, when I was uh, going into Kinky Boots, I was so afraid to show my quirky side and, and embrace the things about me that I thought people wouldn't like. And I just want to encourage you all to make bold choices, is what we call it in, in the acting world. Make bold choices. Um, the way we connect with each other is by being vulnerable. So don't shy away from that. Vulnerability is scary. Um, and, and to that, uh, when we just give negative feedback, uh, we can go into the defense mode and not receive the, the, the criticism. So I always like to, especially with my students, offer them what is working so they know this is what work, what's working. Hold on to that. Don't forget that. Sometimes when I just get the negative feedback, I start going, oh, I was just awful. Every part of it was awful, right? So it is valuable to offer that that positive feedback as well and, and, and root for each other because again, we can be really hard on ourselves. Oh, thank you so much for that. That is so, I think people get very nervous when they are told that they like, might receive some sort of feedback, especially if they're not comfortable with performing. Uh, and so I ask everyone to please go into our breakout groups now with a really open mind and ready to listen to one another. As I just said, we're going to be having you grab an item in your nearby space and tell a really short story about it. And I hope that you will all embrace your vulnerability and embrace your quirkiness in this next section. Molly, does it look like everybody, most people are back? Amazing. Oh, thank you guys so much for joining this session of Near Far, wherever you are. Taylor sadly had to leave because she is incredibly busy, as one would predict during this time. Um, so we will pass on, I'm sure, all the gratitude for her for uh, doing the session with us. And thank you for asking such great questions. I think this is going to be really helpful after, fa uh, after the fact when the recording is released to people that weren't able to make it today. So thank you so much for asking really great questions um, of her. I really feel 
like we were able to get something and I hope that you feel the same way out of this session. Um, if you want to learn more about Taylor, I've put up her website here and as well as her Instagram. She's got a great Instagram, so I'd really recommend checking it out. And be sure to join us next time for our next session of Near Far wherever you are. Uh, we're going to be doing a whole session on igniting your Shabbos flame. Uh, and we're very, very pumped to see you there. And you can always find this, uh, all the up-to-date up information about this series on Facebook. If you were to search near far wherever you are, there is an ongoing Facebook event. And if you are a Moisha House resident, a host, a community member, we are posting about these in every group that we can. So if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Moisha House staff and we will let you know what's going on. Uh, and otherwise, really, that's it for me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a poll going if you'd like to participate in it. We'd love to know if you could choose one musical to be a part of, what would it be from these selections? And really the highlight of my week this week was having to explain what Spamalot was. All right, Wicked is the winner. That's it, defying gravity, baby. All right, thank you guys so much for joining this call. And we hope to see you on our next session. Uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks guys. Bye everybody.